My name is Adil Najm. Uh, I am the director of the Frederick S. Pardee Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future. I said that all in one go. Uh, <laughs> welcome, uh, welcome, welcome everyone, especially thankful to all our guests from out of town. Uh, even more thankful that you are here on this wonderful, beautiful, warm, sunny day. Uh, uh, so early in the morning, uh, we've, we've arranged special Boston weather for our out-of-town uh, guests, but we are really delighted uh, to have you here. We start early in the day because we have a very exciting and rather packed uh, program for which I thank uh, Joe Fusmith, who's been organizing this conference, but we really have a wonderful set of presentations uh, and discussions all day. I won't go into any great detail beyond saying that uh, for us at the uh, Pardee Center, even even though the name might sound different to others, uh, we are not really in the business of trying to predict what tomorrow might look like. Uh, we are much more in the business of trying to understand the realities of today uh, and the steps that might be needed to create a tomorrow uh, that looks better than today. It's somewhat like driving a car. Uh, you always want to keep your eye on the road, which is about the present, but you also want to occasionally look in the rear view mirror to uh, have an idea of where you are coming from, and you should know some, have some sense of where you want to head. Uh, and that's really what this conference uh, is, is, is about, uh, trying to figure out where we want to head. And where we head as a world obviously has very, very uh, important uh, dimensions of where China heads. Uh, in its future. Uh, it is important not simply for the country of China, it is really important for the whole world. And that's really uh, the purpose uh, of the conference today. As I said, I won't go into any of the substance. Joe will do that in a minute. Just a few sort of logistic uh, details, if I might. Uh, as you know, we are, uh, as you guessed, if you didn't know already, we are, we are going to record uh, the uh, the uh, proceedings of each of the panel. Those of you who might have visited our website would see that we have a little multimedia section where we try to put these up. Uh, they do get actually quite a few hits, so, so we get a wider audience who benefit from your views. Uh, partly because of that, but largely out of respect for the other speakers, if I could ask people to please turn off their, their cell phones. Uh, unless, of course, it has a really cool ringer. Uh, <laughs> In which case, you know, it only adds to the ambience. Uh, but but uh, please, please uh, do that. There are mics everywhere, and we'll give you a mic if you have a question. I should note, however, that the mics do not amplify the sound in the room. <laughs> uh, they are real, but they are meant much for for the uh, recording uh, for uh, for for the videos. We'll try to stay on time. Uh, we have a two sessions before lunch. We then have a wonderful uh, lunch uh, plenary where we will have our keynote speaker, Ambassador Stapleton Roy, speaking to us and then two panels uh, after lunch. Once again, uh, welcome, thank you, and my special thanks to Professor Joseph Smith, a colleague and friend for having pulled this together and for having agreed to not sleep one night every week in order to send you midnight emails about the conference. Joe. Thank you very much, Adol, and uh, thank you all for getting up at this ungodly hour of the morning to get over here. Uh, I know that if it were springtime, there are a number of Chinese sayings about how the warm winds uh, provide a convivial atmosphere. I'm not sure the appropriate Chinese slogan saying for when it's really cold out there, you're still welcome, but I'm sure that there is such a saying. Uh, at any case, uh, I, I, you know, this is, this is the 30th anniversary of the inauguration of reform and opening up in China. Uh, and 1978 was an extraordinary year. Uh, this was the year that uh, on May 9th, uh, 1978, People's Daily ran uh, a special uh, contributor's article on true practice as a sole criterion of truth that inaugurated an enormous discussion about China's political direction. And more or less at the same time with the, as that, but totally uncoordinated with it, 18 peasants in the village of Xiaogang uh, were putting their thumbprints on a contract, to, a contract, a legal contract, saying that if any of them were arrested or, or executed for undertaking family farming, that they would take care of the other's children. Uh, and that has 
been taken as the inauguration of the household responsibility system. Uh, by the way, at the time that they put their thumbprints on that contract, the per capita income in Xiaogang Village was 22 renminbi. At the official exchange rate in 1978, that was $11. If you used a real exchange rate, it would have been well, 3 or $4. Uh, even Xiaogang Village, which is not wealthy today, is now at 6,000 renminbi per capita. And so even Xiaogang has come well, along well. And finally, of course, uh, 1978 was the year in which the Carter administration negotiated with China, bringing about the normalization of diplomatic relations between these two countries. And so with the convocation of the third plenary session of the 11th Central Committee in December of 1978, uh, with the inauguration of formal diplomatic relations uh, starting on uh, January 1st, 1979, we really do have the inauguration of reform and opening up. Uh, as for the Pardee Center's uh, hopes to study the longer range future, Anybody that dared predict today's uh, China from 1978 would probably be uh, taken away for good cause. Uh, and that should make us very humble about predicting the future. Nevertheless, not to let this anniversary of the 30th anniversary pass without some effort to sort of sum up how we got to where we are today and what the implications uh, for the future might be seemed to me to be sinful and I didn't want to fall into that. And so we have this conference. Um, needless to say, uh, very grateful to the support of Boston University and particularly to the Pardee Center for the study of the longer range future. And I think we might as well get going right away because we do have a tight schedule. Uh, I'm going to you know, the chairs today, by the way, are all non-China specialists. And so um, their job is sort of to do two things. One is to control the time. Uh, and the other is to uh, interpret our messages. We get too esoteric, give it global significance. And uh, John Gehring uh, of the Political Science Department here at BU will be our, our first uh, moderator and chair. And so I think at this point, um, We'll just start with the first session. Thank you very much. I think it's a great opportunity for uh, Boston University. And it's also a great opportunity for those of us who are not sinologists to think about China within the universe of political science, international relations. Um, and uh, that's something I've thought a little bit about having visited China recently. And I think it's something that the political science community is beginning to think about under the auspices of authoritarian rule, which is the source of a, of a great deal of, uh, of work right now. Uh, and Exhibit A, now that the Soviet Union is gone, is, is always China, um, a very interesting case, and one that's undergone a great deal of transformation in, in recent years. Um, so I'm going to be the, uh, the potted plant here uh, with the timekeeper, and, um, and so I'll simply in, uh, introduce the speakers very briefly and then uh, let them speak for how much time do they have, Joe? About 15 minutes. 15 minutes a person? Okay, I, Unless Good. it's me. Unless it's Joe, <laughs> right, of course, yes. Uh, by the way, John, I think that uh, to give Minya just a chance to collect mm -hmm. her thoughts, I'll well, start. Okay, great. All right, so we'll start with Joe Fusmith, who is professor in the Departments of International Relations and Political Science here at Boston University. Uh, some of you may know the second edition of his China Since Tiananmen was recently published by Cambridge University Press. And Joe's going to speak on the evolution of elite politics. Then we have Yahweh Liu, who's director of the China program at the Carter Center. He's traveled to China and Latin America uh, quite often to observe elections. And he's going to speak on China's elusive quest for choice from the Tianjin model, excuse my uh, non-Chinese pronunciation, to the Giyang experiment. Uh, and then we'll have Jin Tao Ren, who's the dean of the School of Public Administration at Sun Yat-sen University, uh, Guangzhou, uh, Guangzhou, China. He's widely recognized as one of the leading political theorists in China. And finally, uh, Min Ye, who's assistant professor in the Department of International Relations here at Boston University. Uh, she received her PhD from Princeton University and does research on comparative uh, economic reform in China and India. Her topic is how China joined the capitalist world through foreign direct investment, a social network approach to China's economic reform. So we'll start with Joe, and I think I'm going to actually sit over here so I can wave at people as they near the end of their time. Great. OK. 
Okay. Thank you, John. And uh, let's see. I'll try to watch my watch as I do this. Um, okay. As I just mentioned in my uh, introductory comments, China's come a long way. Uh, from those uh, 22 renminbi in Xiaogang village to 6,000 today, or from the uh, uh, Shanghai that in uh, 1980 looked pretty much the same as it did in 1935, except not quite as good, uh, to a Shanghai today that, um, well, is, is, is quite startling as you land there as a first-time visitor. Uh, I haven't landed there as a first-time visitor in quite a while, but in any case, it's, uh, it has, it's cha China has changed a dramatic amount over the last uh, three decades. And um, to me, the, the story of China's um, development uh, over the last 30 years is as much as anything a political story rather than an economic story, or, or let me put it another way, without the politics, the economics would not have happened. Uh, and I'd say that there is absolutely nothing in China's past century prior to 1978 that would lead you to anticipate the last three decades that we've seen. Uh, this is a period of time, of course, it was beset by revolution and civil war. And in the Maoist period, uh, of course, uh, constant political campaigns uh, interrupted by, uh, you know, two Two designated political successors, uh, Liu Xiaoqi and Lin Biao, being undesignated, uh, removed from that position. Uh, and so as you get to 1978, there's absolutely no reason to believe that you would have some stability in the political system. Uh, moreover, if you take a sort of a look back from sort of the um, post-Soviet Union uh, uh, experience, You'd say, uh, well, having engaged in reform and opening up, there's no reason that they should survive. Uh, everybody else, uh, well, not everybody, North Korea uh, is still there, Vietnam, but uh, the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, all had these tremendous political transformations. And so there's really a question, an important question, of trying to explain China's uh, political success at both the elite and, uh, and, and local levels. Um, and I would say that the, uh, in, in, the, in the 1980s, uh, of course, one of, the, one of the keys to success, if you will, uh, was that China was not the Soviet Union, that people like uh, Deng Xiaoping and the other veterans of the uh, revolution were not taken out as Stalin had taken out the old Bolsheviks and finished them off in the labor camps or the, uh, or the uh, execution fields. You did have a collection of people like Deng Xiaoping and other elders who could pull the system back together. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, things really did very well, uh, and sometimes better than we thought in the 1980s. Uh, there was a lot of political discussion. There was a, all sorts of criticism within China about the economic reforms. But the, overall, uh, it, it really went better than most people thought. But there were tensions. Uh, particularly between, if you will, the conservatives and the reformers, and I won't try to further define that this morning. I know it's more complex than that. But eventually that, that tension, uh, along with some student activism and, and other complaints, brought about a tremendous systemic crisis in 1989. And that's where you really expected the regime not to make it. Why didn't it go the way um, other systems did? And if you look at people like Ken Jowett who write on Leninism, uh, the 1989 crisis was both predictable, well, it was predictable, uh, but it should have collapsed, and it didn't. And so one of the questions is how the political system put itself back together, and whether or not looking into the future, that seems like it's a reasonably stable solution. Uh, of course, one of the uh, answers to the question of how the political system put itself back together was uh, that Deng Xiaoping was still there. Uh, if you want to try a thought experiment, imagine Deng Xiaoping having a fatal heart attack on June 5th, 1989. Uh, I think you'd have a very different political situation in China today uh, if that had occurred than if, as it turned out, he did not. Uh, in fact, he, he managed to live long enough, but not too long, to oversee the transformation of the political system. 
there were also actuarial tables that, uh, through chance, worked out in the right order. That is to say, the people who probably would have given China a more um, traditional Leninist system, uh, the Chunyuns of the world, uh, they, they passed in the right order. And so you had Deng Xiaoping uh, living long enough, others passing from the scene. Of course, Deng Xiaoping reviving the reform in 1992 with his, this dramatic trip to Shenzhen in which he called for China to accelerate its reforms. Uh, 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 what, what's extraordinary in this is that he's really using extra institutional means to create institutions something that is, I think, conceptually really hard to deal with. Uh, you're above the system, and yet you are creating systems. What he's actually really doing in sense, though, is not at least directly creating systems, as he is balancing power. Uh, and he did that very effectively. And Jiang Zemin was able to take over and provide something that most authoritarian don't, systems don't do very well, and that is a pretty orderly political succession. And that has now gone from Deng Xiaoping to Jiang Zemin and now to Hu Jintao. Not necessarily as smoothly, I think, as some people would put it, but nevertheless, it's, it's held together. Um, let's see. The, um, now, I think that one of the things which has, has been happening in China over the last 30 years is, uh, the, is as I suggested, the creation of certain institutions. And if you look at elite politics, uh, or even sub-elite politics over the last three decades, we now have some rules guiding, guiding the selection of the political leadership. Uh, there are, of course, retirement rules, which started to be implemented in the early 1980s, and gradually gained a little greater institutional force and began to move up the system. So now, uh, if you are a... Uh, uh, provincial party secretary or governor, you're going to retire when you're 60 years of age uh, and a little, a little older if you're on the Politburo and uh, at least by uh, general secretary you should retire by at least the age of 70. Now the latter requirement is not written down which suggests that there's still some informality and flexibility in the system um, but nevertheless precedent is beginning to, to, um, to take hold here. Uh, you know, as I think that the political leadership does have some informal rules, which I'll get to in a second. On the other hand, you'd, uh, if, if, for instance, Hu Jintao decided that he rather liked the job and decided to stay on until he was 75, I think this would be sort of a constitutional issue in, in real ways and that it would provide a real political crisis in China. And since the cost would be very high, I don't expect it to happen. Uh, in other words, the institutional rules are really beginning to have some teeth to them. Now, having made the case for institutions um, growing up and, and, as I say, having teeth, uh, I'll try to make the other side of the case, which is that they're still a little bit loose. Uh, that the informal distribution of power uh, is still extremely important. So, for instance, in, um, at the 16th Party Congress uh, in 1997, uh, they announced that the rule is going to be, if you're 70 years old, you retire. You look around the room and you say, Chao Shi, Jiang Zemin's chief political rival at that time, you're over 70. Would you mind retiring? I'd be very glad to. Uh, and then, the, of course, party elder Bowie Bo gets up and says, Jiang Zemin, I know you're 71, but you've taken power at a time of critical need. The party and the state need you to stay on. Oh, all right, I will. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, there was a little flexibility as you put in the rules. And then you, you um, um, five years later, okay, the rule is 70, right? Well, the chief political rival at that time is Li Rei Huan, and he's 68. Well, you're promoting Hu Jintao, and you say, we really need to give him a whole new leadership team. So I know you're only 68, but you've served two terms. We'll, we'll say qi shang ba xia. If you're 67, you can stay on the Politburo. If you're 68, you get off. So the, the age has now been lowered to 68. Uh, and um, so you've had this 
this uh, informal um, situation that goes on. And indeed, the, in this last party Congress, uh, I thought this was extremely interesting because uh, it seemed from all outside indications uh, that Hu Jintao hoped to promote uh, his protege, Li Keqiang, as the inheritor of the, his position as party secretary. And there were obviously opposition voices that seemed to come mostly from Shanghai uh, to that idea. And so um, what did they do? They had some inter-party democracy, which is a nice idea. But um, they convened what was really a central committee meeting, although I don't think it was called that, certainly not publicly, um, in, in June, of, June 25th. And that is really the 16th Central Committee. Now, as far as uh, my reading of the party charter is that it's the 17th Central Committee that should elect the Central Committee, that should elect the Politburo, et cetera. So you have the 16th Central Committee actually arranging the political succession is, as I suggest, one of these informal things. Uh, now, what I'm suggesting here is that what we've developed here is a system that where the institutional rules really do have some teeth, but so does the informal balance of power. Uh, and I, in the paper I go on and I, I, I call this quasi-institutionalization. And I, I don't know if that's a good term, and I'll let John, as a real political scientist, tell me if it is or not. But I'm suggesting that a couple of things here. A situation in which formal institutions do mean something, but where informal balance of power also has real meaning here. And that they're in a certain tension, juxtaposition with each other. But I'm not suggesting that it's flowing from informal to formal, but rather that this is a situation that continu can continue for at least an indefinite uh, uh, length of time. Uh, and being uncreative, I would say that that's probably our best guess as to where China will go in the future. Having said that, it is obviously under challenge by a number of things. Uh, popular protest we see. We now have a tremendous international financial crisis that is going to have, have a huge impact on the Chinese political system. And of course, uh, if uh, Jamie Horsley has her way, law will drive this to full institutionalization. Uh, so there are possibilities, but um, uh, I guess being a, a traditionalist, I would vote that uh, China has found something that seems to be appropriate, a mix of formal and informal institutions that seems to provide a, uh, a, a path for the future. And on that note, I will uh, end before John throws me out. Thank you. <laughs> 对，抱歉讲 ideology 这样成就的问题呢，我们一定要这个美丽教授给翻译，然后我才能够讲得漂亮。嗯嗯嗯 ，idea， my topic is ideology change in contemporary China. It is a very heavy topic, and uh, I will uh, ask uh, interpreter 美丽 ，that's me <laughs> to translate my my speech. 大家都知道，中国的改革开放与意识形态的纠缠一直是非常紧密。嗯，也是，嗯 ，We all know, uh, China's reform is intermingled with the ideology struggle. 一九七八年前的中国社会，基本上是由列宁主义和斯大林主义所主宰。Before 1978. Uh, Stalinism and the Leninism are the dominant ideologies in China. 一九七八年以来的改革开放，可以说是以改革为改革提供意识形态。Uh, since 1978, reform itself becomes ideology. 换言之，中国的国家意识形态已经完全改变了形式，而告别了，逐渐告别了。列宁和斯大林主义。In, a, in another word,、um, China's shirking of ideology has been far away from Leninism and also far away from the Stalinism. 但邓小平提供的改革意识形态，并没有能够真正建立起一种新的
国家哲学。However, what Deng has offered about ideology Chen hasn't really uh, uh, become a dominant ideology in contemporary China. Because there are two major components of ideology change. 一部分就是邓小平宣称的坚持马克思主义、列宁主义、毛泽东思想的原有的国家意识形态。Uh, one component is uh, that Deng has uh, promoted to stick to the uh, Marxism and Leninism ideology. 但这样的意识形态已经被文献化，而不对政治发生实际作用。But actually, uh, this Ideology is only written in the document, not a really practical ideology. 改革意识形态的另一部分，就是为了追求经济发展。Uh, another component uh, is the uh, pursuit of economic economic development. 因此，改革意识形态就是以追求发展的实用目的来建立起来的国家哲学。嗯。Actually, uh, China's um, uh, state of philosophy uh, uh, depends on the ideology change actually focus on the uh, uh, purpose of economic development. That's the only uh, standard. This uh, <laughs> This This um, under this situation, the um, debate on uh, ideology actually uh, always under attacking. From Chinese Communist Party's traditional ideological view, change cannot be tolerated by the Marxist traditional Marxist ideology. In uh, one hand, the uh, new uh, ideology. Uh, cannot um, really win the debate with the traditional ideology that CCP has been uh, promoting. 另一方面，改革意识形态又很难承受现代西方主流意识形态的批评。Uh, in the other hand, uh, the reform ideology um, has been under the critics of the Western modern ideology. From this meaning, the change of the change of the change is very transparent. Therefore, the reform ideology is a weak, not very strong ideology. Therefore, in the past 30 years, Therefore, in the past three decades, from the change of the change of the change of the change of the change, 对中国的改革开放发挥着重大的影响。嗯，呃 ，China's ideology change has been under the attack through three directions。第一个方向就是左倾革命意识形态的重组。The first the, um, attack or the first the direction of the attack is from the uh, reconstruction of life, life the, Leftist. 在中国有老左派和新左派之说。In China, we have both traditional of old leftist and new leftist. 老左派强调斯大林主义由中国共产党或者国家力量主宰一切。嗯 ，The old uh, leftist uh, argued. Uh, only the Stalinism or the uh, Chinese com or the Communist Party are dominant. The uh, new leftist uh, uh, focus on the moral ideology. They focus on the uh, Equal distribution, but uh, uh, against uh, reform. 由于新老左派的河流，对中国的改革开放形成的意识形态造成了巨大的政治冲击。Because uh, 
the old uh, leftist and the new uh, uh, leftist uh, uh, combined together. He Liu means what do you mean? He Liu is what? Oh, uh, yeah, they combined with each other. Uh, this become uh, one of the major challenge to China's uh, new ideology change. 另一方面，中国改革开放的意识形态需要现代主流的西方意识形态的支持。嗯。嗯，on uh, on other hand, China's new ideology building needs the support of Western modern ideology。因此，产权、自由、宪政、民主、法治必须要进入中国改革开放的。Therefore, um, property right, um, liberty, democracy, uh, constitution, and also rule of, rule of law must uh, become the major discourse of China's ideology debate. Therefore, um, both economic liberalism and also uh, political liberalism become the uh, major driving force of China's ideology. Sure. 相比而言, 经济自由主义与共产党发展经济的目标相对一致, mm-hmm. 因而在台下, 经济自由主义的流行变成了中国改革开放三十年意识形态图画中最明显的一幅图画。and uh, because of economic uh, liberalism um, uh, um, comes uh, combined with the um, direction of the CCP's reform idea, um, so it becomes compared with the political liberalism, it becomes more uh, influential. 但政治自由主义因为以限制政党和国家权力为目的迄今 because um, uh, political liberalism requires the control of the um, limitation of the uh, political power, so it's not very influ- influential ideology. 左派意识形态和右派意识形态对于改革意识形态造成了双重压力。left and the right uh, ideologies uh, put a lot of pressure on the China's reform ideology. 因此,统一的国家意识形态在中国近三十年很难建立起来。Therefore, uh, in the past three decades, China hasn't really built up a new reform ideology. 因此,自1990年代以来, uh, since the 1990s, there's a variety of ideology has been playing their own rules. Besides traditional Leninism and Stalinism, 主流意识形态, uh, the Western mainstream ideology, 改革意识形态, reform ideology. 此外, 还有国家主义, 民主主义, 等等, mm. Mm. Um, there are also uh, democratism and also nationalism and uh, others um, has been uh, playing their Voice.由于意识形态的复杂状况，因此国家很难对民族精神进行整合，因而国家的认同构成了威胁。Because of the complexity, um, the state China actually uh, is it is very difficult for China to integrate all different ideology into one dominant ideology. This uh, caused the uh, legitimacy problem of CCP. In this situation, the government 
Uh, under this situation, the CCP proposed the discourse on core value and the common value. From Chinese Communist Party to the whole Chinese society, we agree that a modern society's development must be sustained and continuous. It must have a core value as a basis for the whole society. However, from the CCP, the ruling party, to the society, uh, it has been uh, recognized that China needs a, a common value or common, uh, or common ideology to maintain the long-term and the sustainable development. So, the core value or the Call uh, value or common value, what do we see it here? See it here, hi. See it here, the ease. See it the ease. Therefore, both uh, value, uh, uh, call value and common value should be take the responsibility for integrating different ideologies. If I mean, you either, Zongo Gong Tan Dang, Kui, Bu Jiang, Marx, Lerin Zui, or Stalin Zui. On the one hand, it means CCP agree China could choose another dominant ideology besides or beyond Stalinism and Leninism. On the other hand, it means that the national identity needs to be integrated into other non-Western identities, including the Western identities. On the other hand, the, call, uh, the common value should integrate other non-mainstream ideology, including the Western ideology. This is the main purpose of the Western ideology. This is the result of the CCP's uh, pragmatic reform. Therefore, Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao are Therefore, who and when is very much favor the 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 call or the the idea or the conception of call or common value. But the Communist Party's left wing critics have been criticizing the common value and common value. This um, concept, uh, the concept of core value and the common value has been uh, criticized by the conservative. They um, require the CCP to refuse the input of the Western uh, ideology. 因而，从二零零四年以来，意识形态的重新争端对中国的改革开放造成了重大的干扰。嗯嗯 ，Therefore, since 2004, the debate on the uh, construction of new ideology uh, becomes a negative factor for China's economic reform. 可以预期，中国改革开放的意识形态纠缠。还将持续很长时间。Mm. You know, it could be、uh, predict the debate on the ideology, the dominant ideology will be uh, uh, under debate for a long time. 从某种意义上讲，改革意识形态不落实在现代主流意识形态的基本价值、制度安排和秩序整顿上，中国改革开放的意识形态就永远是一个纠缠不清的问题。Therefore, um, the debate on, on dominant ideology should uh, clarify three um, uh, three themes. The first one is the Sun Fang Mia Shim. The Diga Shim. Okay. The the first one um, it should uh, clarify is the basic uh, idea. And the, the basic thought, and the, the second one is the institutional arrangement. The third one is the uh, uh, the order. Uh, 好，谢谢各位，谢谢美丽教授的翻译。<笑>
Right, it's very hard to follow Joe when you talk about uh, palace politics, elite, you know, schemes, conspiracies. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, what happened in the past 10 years uh, from 2008, uh, from 1998 to 2008, what happened in the era of elections. I remember in 1999, uh, Professor Perry and we were observing an election in Chongqing and we heard about the, the Buying election and then we were all trying to find out exactly uh, what happened uh, over there. So I'll start uh, with November the 4th, uh, 2008. You know, that's the day when Obama was elected. Uh, it's also the same day of the 10th anniversary of the organic law of the PRC village committees. I just heard a, a story uh, last night uh, when someone sent me an email saying uh, Beijing Xinjiangbao, that's the new Beijing news uh, that put out four pages on uh, Obama's election, the meaning, the significance. And then the, edi the, the editor was then uh, summoned uh, to the Zhenli Bu, the propaganda department, and said, you know, are you, is Obama related uh, to you? Why are you are putting out four pages, you know, of the consequences uh, and significance of the Obama election? It doesn't recognize Chinese here. So we see the... Where's the PowerPoint? It's, it's all scribbles. It doesn't recognize uh, Chinese characters. There we go. Yep. So that's the 10th anniversary. Uh, I'm not going to belabor, you know, what Li Xueji, the Minister of Civil Affairs, talked about that. But if you look at the second point, bullet point over here, well, he mentioned about the significance of village elections. He specifically had to mention that all these elections are under the leadership of party branches. It's just shocking that when they were celebrating the 10th anniversary on the same day when Obama was elected, you know, no uh, top leadership showed up. And it was just the minister himself uh, talking about it. And he made it very clear that everything happened under the strong leadership uh, of, of the party. Uh, so, you know, there are lots of questions uh, that we need to ask about the real status uh, of elections uh, in China, which have been involved uh, in the past uh, 10 years. Uh, so what we're going to do next is going to trace what happened in the past 10 years and then draw some tentative uh, conclusions. Uh, so I call this great leap forward, uh, you know, from 1998 to 2004. If you look at what happened uh, following the Buying election, it was very, very exciting that everyone seemed to believe that there is a battle plan, there is a blueprint, there is a timetable for China to move forward. It started with Shenzhen's initial request that we want the township magistrate to be directly elected, which was uh, very quickly rejected uh, by the standing committee of the NPC. And then the Buying I mentioned at the very beginning happened. Now, the Buying election on December the 31st, the last day of 1998, uh, eventually was uh, determined to be unconstitutional. But no one was punished uh, for organizing the election. Three years later, the officials in Suining, which is uh, on top of the Buying, uh, went ahead with another sort of, you know, amended you know, election procedures. Uh, uh, which is also very, very interesting. And then uh, in Hubei, you know, where Yu Zhensheng uh, was the party secretary, it was a lot of rumors saying, you know, Zheng Qinghong was behind uh, that experiment. You know, this election was interesting because a large group of scholars were invited to observe uh, the Yangji election, and they wrote articles, a book was published. Uh, and then in August 2003, there is the failed uh, Pingba uh, direct election. You know, the party secretary, which was strongly, you know, double, double, doubly regulated or, you know, put under house arrest, still trying to reverse uh, the verdict uh, on him. Uh, but the biggest one happened in Honghe, uh, that's April 2004. Uh, what's interesting about the Honghe election is uh, it involved over 100,000 voters. Uh, it was not reported by the media until seven months after uh, the election took place. And then there was an investigation of what happened over there. The party secretary uh, who authorized the election uh, was put into 
some sort of interrogation, and he told them, you know, I have one head. If you want it, you know, take it. Uh, I really don't mind what you're going to do. Nothing happened, but uh, it's just, you know, when somebody saw something very exciting and then nothing was going to happen, so it's kind of sad uh, to see that. And then in 2003, uh, the People's Congress deputy elections at the district level. In China, that's also direct elections. Uh, in Beijing and in Shenzhen, uh, they're really exciting moment. I mean, if you look at the number of candidates, you know, we call duly hoxian, independent candidates, uh, who didn't go through the party screening, you know, who declared their candidacy and who tried to raise money, who tried to campaign. It was very, very exciting. And both in Shenzhen and, and Beijing, you know, we, uh, as a Western organization, you know, we follow this, and some of the candidates even use our website uh, as where they are declaring their candidacy and put out their statements. And uh, so it was very exciting. Uh, there were meetings. Uh, there were lots of soul searching as to, you know, what does this mean? Does this mean the revolution is going to take place uh, from the bottoms up? Uh, and it was also a honeymoon between uh, China and all uh, Western organizations, the Carter Center, International Republican Institute, I think Jamie's uh, China Law Center, uh, Duke China Election Study Group. And, you know, there are lots of other organizations. They were all invited to go to China uh, to observe elections and also to provide uh, assistance and advice uh, to the election uh, procedures. And then the big chill came. Uh, this is uh, the so-called uh, color revolution, you know, what happened in Central Asian countries and how Chinese officials and uh, scholars, I, I think the scholars uh, have played uh, a very important role here in convincing the top leadership that uh, the United States and other Western countries, they have a conspiracy. Uh, they are going to use NGOs in these countries uh, to create this instability and to manufacture the loss of the incumbent parties and to overthrow the party and the government. Uh, so it was in this context, you know, things uh, began to uh, really uh, tighten uh, very heavily. But at the same time, uh, you hear the leadership of China uh, talking about, you know, we still have a plan, we're going to move forward, uh, we're going to implement it. Uh, I, I want to specifically mention uh, Wen Jiabao. Uh, you know, I've been listening to him uh, in, in the past three years. Each and every time he was asked a question about political reform, he just repeats himself. You know, for those who hears him for the first time, Oh, that's enormous. You know, that's really great. But for those, you know, who listen to him all the time, say, that's all cliche. You know, maybe he's sincere. Maybe he's just helpless. He couldn't do it. But, you know, he likes to talk about it. And most of the foreigners fall for him. They all like Edgar Snow, you know, who listened to Mao and basically said, well, this is the future. You know, I've seen the future type of mentality. Uh, the turning point came in August uh, 2006. This is uh, Shen Huaren. You know, he slams the break on election. The key argument he made in the article, which I actually is also a party and state council circular, is saying uh, it is very clear now that the uh, United States and other countries are ch trying to penetrate China politically through manipulating or instigating during uh, the time when grass elections, grassroots elections are uh, taking place. So he... Uh, issued the warning. He also made it very clear we're not going to allow anything like Bu Yun, like Yang Ji, or Hong He to happen uh, in China. So from that point on, it, all elections in China are very quiet, invisible to the outsiders, and totally boring uh, to the Chinese people uh, themselves. And then we see John Thornton, you know, who is in charge of the Brookings uh, China Center. You know, he and a large Brookings group went to. Uh, Beijing, and as I said earlier, they listened to Wen Jiabao, and they were all impressed that you know, something big is going to happen. Uh, by the way, what John Thornton heard in October 2006 is that exactly the same thing Wen Jiabao told uh, Zakaria uh, back in September this year while he sat down for the interview uh, with CNN. <clears throat> So from the 16th Party Congress, Joe talked about, to the 17th Party Congress, uh, Hu Jintao, you know, both of them delivered uh, political reports. You know, there's really nothing very new uh, down there. Uh, but Hu Jintao in the 17th Party Congress did talk about, uh, you know, in order for China to move forward, the party will have to democratize first. And he was very specific in terms of uh, what the party should do, at least, you know, from the grassroots level 
and up forward. And that comes to you know, the, the initial title of my paper is the Qingxie model. Uh, I understand uh, Professor uh, Perry Steele uh, did a dissertation, Ren Xiaojun, on, on the Qingxie model. So there are lots of details down there. Uh, what I'm focusing over here, because uh, you know, I think in my footnote of, of the paper is when uh, Zhao Chaoying, the party secretary of Qingxie, uh, when he first started the Qingxie model, he was under tremendous pressure. Uh, you know, I was at the Ministry of Civil Affairs office when he called uh, the official, and he broke down on the phone call, basically saying, you know, the Hebei Zhuzhibu Department of Organization is basically saying, you know, he has a plan. Uh, to undermine, to weaken the party uh, in, in Qingxian. Because uh, like uh, if you see over here, his approach is let the party handle the big issues and let the village committee handle the small issues. So you ask what are the big issues? The big issues are the training, purification of ideology and the recruitment, but all decision making on how money is going to spend, uh, whether a construction project is going to take place, you know, we should all refer that. Uh, to the village committee. So that has to change. And so eventually, the, the, the essence of the Qingxian model is subject the party to some sort of popular choice. They created sort of a, 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 a extra legal institution called the Village Representative Assembly. And they want the party chief to run for the speaker position of that assembly. You know, there are lots of problems with this new institution because this was not written into any of the laws. So this is basically uh, institution artificially created by the party. You know, I'm sure maybe the new law, uh, the new organic law may add this, uh, and that law is subject uh, to uh, approval, you know, I think sometime uh, next year. Uh, so that's the, the, you know, the challenges I, I talked uh, about. Now, the last thing here is, is the Guiyang model. You know, what happened in Guiyang, I have all these numbers over here, so I'll quickly go over, you know, the whole election took about uh, 55 days. This is filling up four positions, all at the county level, party secretary. You know, not the government side, but the party side. A total of 81 uh, preliminary candidates. And I will have super delegates, just like the super delegates here in the U.S., 275. And they're going to decide, you know, how many of them are going to run. So they trimmed 81 to 20, uh, five candidates, uh, for each position. And then there are six hurdles for the candidates to clear. You know, you, you have to declare that you're going to run. There's a primary. There's a field of research. Everyone has to go where they want to be, the next party secretary, you know, the place to do investigation. You write up a report. You do your presentation. And then you take a, a test on the computer. That's your capacity, capability, skill test. And after all of that, you know, 48 members, these are the electors. These are members of the municipal party committee. So they listen to the speech and then they vote. Now if you look at the vote outcome over here, you know, 48 of them, you look at the lopsidedness of the two candidates, you know, it, it just makes you feel if there is some manipulation uh, involved. Because you look at the score, you know, each and every of the eight candidates scored, it's very close, but the vote turnout uh, is kind of big. So it makes you think maybe the party has uh, pick someone, you know, or the party is favoring someone, so all the voters are interested. We don't know. I mean, the details are kind of scarce. Uh, and then, you know, what happened after the election? Basically, it's knowledge is popular sovereignty. Uh, is this going to be the future of, of, of China? Because, you know, both what happened in Nanjing, which I didn't talk about, and what happened in Guiyang, they seem to be putting the party in control However, the final outcome may not be controlled by the party, if the party really is going to relax uh, everything, you know, let the candidates, but still everything happens within the free framework of the supremacy uh, of the party. So if, if I still have a minute or so, I'll just go over the, the sort of uh, some tentative uh, conclusions. Uh, is, you know, Joe talked about Xiaogang, you know, when the peasants decided they're going to privatize the land, the leadership saw that as an opening. So they made the decision and things started changing. Uh, you know, there are moments like Xiaogang in the political reform area, but there is no leadership with the vision and the courage, you know, to sort of use that, uh, you know, and to create uh, opening. So that's one uh, conclusion we can draw. Now the second one uh, is 
what I mentioned, you know, through the presentation is that, you know, the, the, the whole idea that there is a plan, uh, it doesn't seem to be there. It's, it's kind of like a bubble. It's a, it's a, a mirage. Uh, so what we don't know uh, what's going to happen. Uh, the sum of all fears is that, you know, if you are going to move forward with the elections, the Western countries, the agents, the shock troops, they're all going to jump in. Uh, it's going to derail the party's legitimacy. It's going to end uh, in uh, creating instability uh, in, in China. Uh, in terms of village elections, which has fascinated uh, so many people outside China, including me, uh, as both a Chinese and an American, uh, it seems it, its mission uh, is over because all the things the government or the people are facing now, none of that can be really resolved by deepening the village committee elections. So if you continue to build that as a seminar of 900 million Chinese, it seems to me is uh, disingenuous. It's, it's a uh, attempt, you know, to delay what's going to happen at a higher level. I think this is something I do want to mention: is that China, more and more Chinese. I think Ren Jiantao uh, talked about the ideology, talked about universal values, and the peculiar uh, Chinese value is more and more Chinese, particularly the elite, uh, all seem to believe uh, we have created a new model. You know, we don't, we can have the market economy, but we don't need liberal democracy. The so-called, you know, the decline of the Washington consensus and, and the rise of the Beijing consensus. Uh, and, you know, they have all the evidence to support that, you know, we are now talking about city upon hill uh, in this city. We're now the new beacon. We're now the new city upon hill. The whole world uh, is watching and we're creating something totally different. And uh, India is going to go to learn from us. African countries are going to learn from us. Uh, we're really different. Chinese exceptionalism. Uh, but I still believe that democratization is inevitable uh, because, you know, given the challenges China is facing, you have to have some sort of uh, safety valve. You have to find something for people to reduce and release their anger. You know, otherwise uh, it's going to be uh, explosive. So in this context, you know, assuming uh, something you know, opening and the reform are going to take place. Maybe Qingxian is the way to go, but particularly the Guiyang experiment seem to be more uh, meaningful. Uh, you know, my last argument is that China doesn't have to adopt Western-style elections at all. You know, the party, all the party needs to do is to allow the voters to elect who they are entitled to elect according to the Chinese election laws and the constitutions. I think that will change China big time. But, but now the fear is there. They just won't trust the people to do it. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, so my topic today is about uh, China's FDI policy. Uh, let me start with a couple of comparative cases to show why I find this particular policy especially intriguing. Um, so in in, uh, uh, in 1968, so 1968, 10 years before uh, China's economic reform, uh, South Korea started a uh, 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 very, very uh, ambitious, uh, extensive industrialization uh, strategy based on foreign loans and uh, uh, foreign, foreign technology. But they have resisted FDI until the 1990s, and only after 1997, uh, Asian financial crisis did the uh, FDI begin to play some role in Korean economy and uh, in uh, Latin America and the region was involved in global capitalist economy uh, for a very long time uh, but in 1960s and the 70s including 1980s the dependential literature was dominating and influencing uh, political discussion of, uh, on FDI in political science and in 1965, India. Uh, India had uh, uh, opened two export uh, rented units uh, similar to the Chinese special economic zones in 1965. So that was much, much earlier than China. But the two zones uh, remained dysfunctional for a very long time. And in 1979, almost the same time as China was inviting FDI, uh, India was uh, forcing <coughs> out multi multinational corporations, including Coca-Cola and IBM. Um, so why the Chinese 
situation would be so different. So China started a very, very limited FDI open, uh, open policy uh, in 1979, really late 1979. And uh, the trend was, uh, the, was rapidly growing since then. Um, so, so, sorry, I was using Mac. I wasn't very familiar with Mac, so the, 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 the figures, I wasn't able to mm -hmm. put the years. <laughs> Those would be just numbers. Just remember, <laughs> this was from 1979 to 2004. And the other figure on trade was also for 1979 to 2004. So just uh, to show the trend, how the Chinese uh, uh, openness policy would be so successful and so rapid. And also, I want to argue uh, that I, I don't need to, uh, I just want to make the point that uh, FDI was contributing a large portion of exports from China. So in 1995, almost 50% uh, of exports were done by foreign investor firms in China. And in 2005, uh, more than 80, around 80% 80 of high-tech exports from China was done by foreign investor firm. Uh, so uh, I think it's viable to argue that the Chinese economic success or industrialization was uh, uh, based on foreign investor, uh, uh, foreign direct investments. So. Uh, uh, again, uh, turning back to the comparative cases, so why the Chinese case would be so, uh, for openness policy would be so uh, durable and so successful? There are uh, several models, and uh, three of them are most uh, um, uh, dominant, I believe. The number one was the individual rationality model. Uh, that, that model looks at individual leaders. Uh, really, I, I think today we heard a lot about leadership argument and elite uh, politics at the top. And the second model will, looks at economic bureaucracies, institutions, and rules of games. So the, and the third model uh, was societal perspective. So they look at M mostly local governments and uh, um, uh, local, uh, lo local actors and those as contributing or leading economic reform in China. And this, uh, this, um, li this literature has produced lots of insights. And here I'm not uh, uh, really disputing these models. I just want to add another one. That is a social network model, uh, which looks at uh, the interactions between the, the state actors and uh, social actors and the transfers of in information and ideas and how these, the, the ties or the strength on uh, ties between the different actors influence the policy outcomes. So based uh, looking at uh, those models uh, in existing literature, I ask uh, three specific questions. Uh, the number one, if individuals were responsible for initiating new economic policies, uh, where and how the, those uh, individuals get the information about the policy and how they sustain the policy. So those questions were really not addressed in the, in the uh, uh, rationality model. And the second is, if the local governments were the main agents of change, again, where, where were the uh, sources of information and uh, resources? And also, why only some of them? So not uh, not all local governments were were uh, uh, were leaders were, were leading the the policy experiments. Only some very limited them. So what what different ties or different information they they have, and finally. Um, Lots of open strategies in other cases had failed. So uh, why is the Chinese strategy was uh, endurable and expensive? And, and these are just uh, a few uh, insights from so sociology, and I applied in the uh, in the paper. I will quickly go over one, uh, each of them. Uh, decision making, in, according to sociology. And I think many, many of political scientists probably wouldn't dispute this, that decision making is based on, is, is embedded in social relations. And because information and the resources flow through uh, these uh, social relations. And here I will uh, especially emphasize on external networks rather than the internal networks, because I want to look at the, the um, implement, in, implementation of a new policy. So it's an innovative adoption. 
So, see, in 1978, FDI openness was very new to China, and how that became uh, become uh, became a, a more dominant strategy. And, and if we look at the adoption of new policy, then the information or resources typically. Uh, came from uh, uh, outside, so, uh, not from your internal jurisdiction. So here, the external networks that uh, provide new information and uh, re new resources often de uh, decide the the outcome. And and I also uh, in the in the sociology, uh, uh, the innovative diffusion analysis, they also explain uh, what a type of ties are more effective in persuading the, the others. Um, so there are two, really, there are two uh, elements. One was a perceived superiority of ideas. So for instance, um, for Chinese, if they perceive Perceive the the foreigners have superior ideas. It's more likely they will adopt the the the, the foreigners' uh, uh, practice. And the second component is the quality of ties. So whether you trust the other person, uh, uh, how many of the ties are uh, are available between you and the others. Um, so both. Both elements can be strengthened by the concept or the something called homo, uh, hom homophily. Homophily uh, refers to the, the shared attributes between decision makers and uh, the external actors. Um, here I bring in the diaspora uh, elements here. Uh, for instance, the uh, diasporas, they share the same uh, physiological attributes, speak the same language and, uh, and the cultural backgrounds, all sorts of things. So their ties are stronger. For the Chinese or, or local governments in Guangdong, they perceive the diaspora, diasporas more trustworthy. They are more like us. Um, so here, the quality of ties are, are typically uh, better than the ties between China, uh, between the Chinese, say, uh, foreigner, uh, of Western foreigners. Um, and, and similarly, the perceived idea superiority will be also strengthened by, uh, by the homophily. So let me give you an example. For instance, if Somebody is almost like you, right? Has the same background, same education. You believe they have the same level intellectual capacity, but they achieved uh, economic success by doing business. And it's much more likely you'll follow the suits and do the business than, say, uh, a, a white person who is very different from you. You perceive as a completely different that that doing the, sa the, the, the same thing and achieved success. So the home family also strengthened the superiority ideas. And the diffusion analysis. Another thing I, I took I took from them is a. Uh, uh, Process of diffusion. Uh, so the the because exactly because of the internal actors or domestic actors, they have different access to external information and resources, and some will become early adopters or a new practice, and uh, uh, others uh, uh, become uh, laggards. And uh, the diffusion from a limited experiments to a broader policy practice is uh, of, uh, or, or often. Um, dependent on early success. So the early success leads to the expansion. And early success, and again, is uh, 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 relies on the external resources as well. Uh, I also talk about in the paper that uh, there are three mechanisms that uh, policy making will be affected by external networks um, through demonstration, persuasion, and co-option. So external actors, they uh, demonstrate how the policy is done and uh, how superior to your existing policy. Uh, co-option, we all talk about the resistance to, uh, pra uh, uh, to, to a new practice. And the external actors can um, influence, uh, uh, can co-opt the opposition um, as well. So this is a, a very simple model uh, about the Chinese diaspora influencing China's FDI policies. So the diasporas. Uh, in Hong Kong or Taiwan, uh, in the early period, uh, 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 pretty much in Hong Kong. So diaspora in Hong Kong, they influence local governments, and local governments in turn influence the central governments about the effectiveness of openness. Uh, and that leads to limited policy opening. And because of Hong Kong's 
uh, uh, demonstration over there, and also lots of contracts, like uh, economic uh, contracts from Hong Kong. Uh, the the experiments achieved early success, and the early success brought more local governments uh, on board, and their. Uh, the, uh, the, the in turn leads to a broader opening. So the next uh, couple uh, slides will be uh, on how the uh, specific periods of China's economic reform and how the diaspora networks influence those reform outcomes. So from 1978 to 1980, the special economic zone policies, uh, the special economic zone policy was implemented in 1980, and I, I traced the process leading to the policy and especially look at how the central leaders preferred uh, uh, available other uh, policies, including the socialist adjustments and a developmental state model. As you can see from the Chinese wording, they wanted to xuexi, learn a socialist adjustments from Yugoslavia, and uh, they want to <coughs> jie jie, uh, uh, borrow something from the developmental states. But they, they thought the SEZ policy is just uh, worthwhile to research. and for. For us who know Chinese, this is very much, they say, no, forget about it, the yen jiu, yen jiu, let, let that to study them. And now we know, in retrospect, that least preferable policy became <coughs> a dominant policy later on. Uh, okay. And this is to the uh, other process. And then again, a uh, policy faced uh, strong opposition in 1982 and to 1984. Uh, the central, in fact, in, in, in Beijing there was a, a re-centralization, but it, at the local level, the diaspora networks to uh, local governments remained strong, so there was different dy dynamic going on at the local level. And Deng Xiaoping also had uh, the first uh, southern tour in 1984. Um, and here, the, that southern tour, in fact, convinced Deng Xiaoping now, Deng Xiaoping went to look at the special economic zones, but he and the other elders were convinced of success because this Guangdong, especially Shenzhen, the special economic zone, just uh, experienced dramatic change in the in the in the four years, and he was convinced. Include uh, the other conservative elders who accompanied him were also convinced. Um, in 1989. Again, there was a major uh, backlash against uh, uh, economic reform. By 1992, the Southern Tour, in three years, the Southern Tour uh, uh, ushered in another open strategy. Um, so I will talk ab about the three, maybe I, I won't talk about uh, the three things. Um, <laughs> so in the paper, there are three uh, fa factors uh, that that, that were unrelated to Deng Xiaoping were very, very conducive to the durability openness strategy. Uh, so Deng Xiaoping was important, but the other uh, factors were also very, very important. And the new dynamics, I think Joe's paper provided a much, much more profound discussion, uh, including the book too. So <laughs> I'll just skip in this. So about the future, just uh, 30 seconds. Um, uh, I, I think there are several things about the future. First of all is whether the uh, openness strategy would uh, be sustained. And, and uh, I, I, I think it will be, because uh, domestic interest is uh, so embedded in openness. So that, stra that future is for sure. And second is about the diaspora impact. I think it will be, it's declining. And in fact, it has declined in the 1990s, because of the, uh, the perceived ideolo uh, ideolo uh, ideational superiority was declining. And now that China themselves had the money, had the uh, ideas, of why do they have to listen to these uh, 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 outsiders? So they were declining. Um, so I was uh, thinking about the, the other type of diasporas might have some influence, that is overseas Chinese, the returnees. There were more and more returnees back to China. But because they were, they were less uh, organized, or the, 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 the impacts would be much, much uh, uh, difficult to, to pursue systematically. And another type of uh, influence will be from the Westerners, like uh, Jamie and lots of guys, you, you guys in, in the room. So uh, those 
uh, you will influence uh, Chinese reform in other areas, not uh, the openness, but uh, there are so many issue areas in China. Uh, but I think that will be very difficult for the exact reason the perceived uh, identity differences, because the Chinese perceive them as different. Um, so the, the situation would be a lot more complex. Thanks, John. Thanks for the comment. <laughs> I, uh, I appreciate having this opportunity to comment on, on four interesting papers. I wish I had maybe an hour or so, but uh, I'll try to use uh, about uh, three or four minutes just to raise some questions. Obviously, as an outsider, I can't add anything uh, substantively to these, these uh, very interesting uh, topics, but I may be able to raise some questions that, that uh, all of us can consider. Um, with respect to, to uh, Joe's paper, I, I have long thought that institutionalization uh, is uh, an understudied, maybe overused and understudied is the, is the term that I would apply to it. Um, it's, to me, uh, I, you know, I'm, I went to a, a graduate program where Weberianism was in the air. We all assumed that there was such a thing as institutionalization. I think there are those who might doubt its existence, but I'm willing to believe it's there. But I think the interesting questions are perhaps why does this process get started? It, 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 surely it's not inevitable um, in the sense that, you know, you have maintain a regime framework, things institutionalize over time. I don't, think, I don't see it quite that way, but I think it would be very interesting to try to get inside the box to figure out, you know, what are the pressures for and against institutionalization? And, and that way I think we can learn a little more about it as a, as a causal process more generally and also uh, in China. Um, with respect to uh, Jintao Ren's uh, talk about the role of ideas, I guess the naive outsider would tend to look at the Chinese case and uh, assume that this was a classic argument for why ideas don't matter. I mean, after all, the result that we seem to be getting in China is directly contrary to the official ideology. But of course, that would be a very naive view. And I think um, if I understood the gist of his paper, uh, it is about how the role of ideas is actually quite important in legitimizing, or not, perhaps, uh, the, uh, the regime. Um, maybe, that's, maybe that's all I'll say. Again, the force of ideas is probably the hardest thing in, in social science to study in a, in a kind of um, convincing manner because we don't really see, we, don't, we can observe ideas, but we don't really know what the exogenous factor is that's driving people to think differently about things and then what the effect of that might be. But I think there are some ways to go about doing that. Um, the third paper by uh, Lu, Yahweh Lu um, on the uh, democratization in China, I think there are some, some really fascinating questions. If we, if we think about China as a kind of um, you know, a, a, a place where democracy has been suppressed for a long time and it's starting to bubble forth. There's some fascinating questions that we can ask about where the origin of these, uh, of this new impulse or stimulus might lie. Um, now this might or might not help us predict its trajectory in the future, but it would be, and, and, you know, might shed some light on that. It would nonetheless be fascinating to know a little bit more about which townships, which regions, which individuals are pushing and which are resisting. And I don't mean this from the simple, you know, bottoms pushing, top is resisting, because I think the, the story is much more complicated. And we can learn a lot about democracy, not just in China, but elsewhere in the world from examining that process. Um, finally, with respect to uh, Minier's paper on the, the role of social networks, um, you know, I'm, I'm very willing to believe that social networks are critical to China's success. Uh, but again, it's a very difficult thing to prove because the existence of social networks is, uh, in a sense, endogenous to where people find themselves on that network, right? Um, so it's certain regions of China by the coast, you know, in the south, southeast that have these very strong social ties to Chinese living abroad in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and elsewhere. And these have been the areas where you've found the greatest uh, uh, push towards opening and the expansion trade and so forth. A lot of that is... Some of that, I suppose, is ideas. Some of it is, is the sheer fact of interest that they share in common, the family ties, the degree of trust that's there that can be built upon to create um, uh, where social networks lead to, to, uh, to uh, capitalist networks. Um, very difficult to tease that apart. And I guess what I would look for or would want to try to look for is some example uh, or, or 
uh, a kind of intensive look maybe at a single region where you can compare different townships, some of which have these family alliances due to previous, uh, uh, you know, immigration uh, uh, patterns, and others of which do not, and kind of kind of really figure out what the independent factor is. Are the are the villages that have these ties because their their uh, families or ancestors migrated years ago? Are they really thinking about things differently? Um, and is or is that uh, I guess the alternative thesis would be it's because they already were different from the villages that didn't have those ties, and that's what's driving the underlying network. That's a very difficult question to tease out. In any case, uh, I'll put this on the table, and I'm guessing that it's more fruitful for us to open it up to questions from from the floor rather than <laughs> maybe a little unfair, but rather than to give the speakers a chance to respond. So, so should I sort of oh, well, call on people? I, of course, I don't know people, but if you could just raise your hand and, and state your question or comment, but try to be as brief as possible since we really just have a, a few minutes. In the back here. Uh, this is a comment and a question. And, and, and perhaps just for the benefit of everyone, if you could introduce uh, yourself. I'm Professor Sushil I'm here at the School of Management, uh, sixth floor. Uh, there's a question for, uh, or a comment for Professor Yahweh Liu. Uh, you said that it's very likely that there will be a change in China for a number of reasons, uh, one of which is that there's a level of corruption which kind of might create some need for change. Uh, I study India. I'm originally from India. And there's been democracy for 60 years. Level of corruption in India is probably as high, if not higher, than in China. So I wonder whether the need for change uh, stimulated by corruption can actually bring about democracy? Do, do we answer the question now, or is do, this going on? Do you want to take uh, three or four questions? Sure. Or? We'll take a couple questions, and then we'll see if we can uh, can respond to the questions. In the back here. Um, I was wondering how the Neo-Confucianism discourses fit into this story, and what and who is adopting them, and how they're because they seem to be quite different than for the Marxist-Stalinist discourses and how what these sort of discussions are going on around those. Okay, maybe one more and then we'll give the panelists a chance to respond. Okay, over here. And if you'll just wait for the microphone to reach you. There we go. I'm Jennifer Badersky, Jr. in College of Arts and Sciences. This question is directed to Professor Fusmith. Um, you were talking about informal versus formal power, but I was looking at Chinese history and it seems like informal power seems to dominate quite frequently where Mao like steps back after the Great Leap Forward and he still in, like holds a lot of sway and influence, Deng Xiaoping as well with his southern tour. If formal and informal power were to ever to conflict with each other, which one would dominate? Does it matter between who has the actual power, like communism stressing central leadership, mm -hmm. Or it doesn't matter about the leader himself. Okay, thanks. So now there's a there's a lot on the table, and I'll leave it to the speakers to decide what they want to respond to. Um, should we go? Should, should we start with you? All right. Uh, th the question is very hard to, to answer. Uh, Pre Professor Perry organized a fascinating panel at AAS uh, early this year, comparing China to, to India. I think India now uh, is uh, one of the most important. Uh, I guess evidence used by the anti-democracy people in China to say, look at India. It's the largest democracy in China. You know, look at its economy. Look at you know all the things that have gone bad in India. It's certainly not a model uh, for China to to follow. Uh, whether uh, corruption will bring democracy, you know, I, I think uh, one case after another are now breaking open uh, in in China, uh, and the Chinese leadership is not willing to embrace uh, sort of election as as an opening. So I, I guess, you know, it's going to go somewhere maybe to Jamie's uh, rule of law and, and transparency, uh, open government information. I think that probably is going to be an area where the government is going to look, not necessarily democracy as we understand it, but certainly to open things up. To put it in simple, there are uh, 
two dimensions to understand the uh, Im impacts of uh, the relationship between new Confucianism with other ideology. 一方面，新儒家特别强调就是道德理想主义要承继传统儒家的立场，但另一方面，新儒家也追求自由、民主、平等。因此，在这个意义上，新儒家与西方主流意识形态的一致性是可以保证。Yeah. First, um, uh, even though the new Confucianism continued the, the pursuit of the traditional uh, Confucianism and the uh, moral idea, ideal model, uh, moral ideology, on the other hand, the new Confucianism also emphasized the, the concept of uh, uh, liberty, uh, democracy that Western, uh, Western philosophy uh, per uh, focus or promote. 另一方面，新儒家的近期发展是有追求意识形态的倾向，因此在国学热当中的新儒家与传统的新儒家有很大的区别。嗯嗯。On the, uh, on the other hand, the new Confucianism has also been pursuing the uh, 追求什么 Sorry, I forgot. 追求什么 Oh, sorry. The the new Confucianism has also um, uh, pursuing ideology, the new ideal, the dominant ideology. Um, in this way, um, you know, there is quite different from the traditional Confucianism. 比如像蒋庆这样的学者对新儒家的重建，是要求新儒家能够取得国家意识形态的地位，这就与马克思主义的国家意识形态有了冲突。他们之间的关系究竟怎么样，还需要观察。嗯 ，For example, uh, one very famous per, uh, scholar, Jiang Qing, um, he argues, uh, New Confucianism should, uh, pursue the dominance of the uh, Confucian, new Confucianism in the in the uh, in state uh, become the state ideology. Uh, in this way, uh, there's a, a confliction between the new Confucianism and the, the Mar traditional Marxism. So he is unpredictable. You know how will that <laughs> go? You know that that's my answer. On the question of formal versus informal power, yeah, um, I guess you'd have to say informal power has been rather dominant, or personalistic power has been pretty dominant throughout the 20th century. So why should it change? Which gets something to the question of, of why institutions might might be created. I uh, wish I could give you a complete answer. Partial answer would be in part because uh, Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping have died. And their successors, uh, Jiang Zemin, uh, Li Peng, Hu Jintao, that generation, um, are fundamentally bureaucrats. Uh, they uh, have very different career paths. These are not people that overturn heaven and earth to take their political positions, but people that have climbed the ladder. And it also, j the, the whole succession process at different levels has raised questions of, of raise that old political question, I should say, about why are you being promoted and I'm not? And that creates a certain demand, at least an implicit demand, for at least some form of procedural regularity. Uh, now, procedural regularity doesn't mean that you eliminate personal and informal politics, which is, I think there's still a very strong component of it. But it does suggest that there are at least reasons for why you would want to set up criteria such as age for retirement or promotion, educational background, experiential things. It gives the process at least a, at least a superficial legitimacy. So even if somebody was promoted for personalistic reasons, you can explain that they at least fit all the procedural things. And, and sometimes when you keep saying these things for enough long enough time, they begin to, to have teeth. Uh, could this uh, be blown apart? Uh, yes, of course. And uh, China is facing a number of challenges. Corruption is one. Uh, India may still be corrupt. I, I don't know how do you measure India's corruption versus China's. Both are impressive. Uh, <laughs> 
at any case, um, one could at least imagine uh, China being, uh, the political system being uh, disrupted or overturned because of corruption without that democratization solving the problem of corruption. Uh, uh, there are other reasons why this pattern, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe laws will really matter. And uh, that, would, that would also upset the pattern. So there are a num number of challenges out there, I think. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> okay. I guess we've used up our time. I want to thank the panel and uh, looking forward to the rest of the day. Thanks to Joe for putting this together. Thank you.